Welcome to this video on the top 10 vampires of Clan Ventru. Here we are at last. It's been a long road, but we are finally at the end. The last of the modern clans of Vampire the Masquerade, and according to themselves, the greatest. Clan Ventru. The Ventru are occasionally called the Clan of Kings, the Warlords, the Blue Bloods. All of these names capture a part of what the Ventru are and what they do, but not the whole. The Ventru are a clan dedicated to effective organization. Even going back to antiquity, the Ventru have always held to some variation of the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that a clenched fist is always stronger than a single finger. Ventru unity is different from the demented ancestor worship of the Asimites and the Setites, or the paranoia of the Giovanni and the Tremere. Ventru unity is based on a simple, rational self-interest. All Ventru benefit when a Ventru holds power, and it is the duty of Ventru to use their power for the benefit of the clan. A rising tide lifts all boats, even when some vampires' boats are just a wee bit bigger than others. But enough with the cliches. Here are the top 10 vampires of Clan Ventru. Number 10, Artemis Orthia. The Ventru antediluvian sired a brood much like his brothers and sisters did. One of the most notable was Medan, the god king of the Aegean. Medan, after lording over his mortal herd, was dragged from his palace during the day and left to burn in the sun. Medan's death taught the rest of the Ventru a valuable lesson. The power of organized mortals could bring down even the mightiest Cainite. The Ventru, who was not yet Artemis, was sister to Medan. She wandered the earth after hearing of Medan's downfall. Eventually, sometime in the 10th or 9th century BC, she settled in the Peloponnesian region of Greece, in a rustic little community settled by Dorian Greeks made up of four villages, Limni, Pitana, Kinosura, and Mesoa. One night she met a man of royal blood, long separated from his home in thanks to the jealousy and intrigues against him. A man who loved justice, even to the point that he twice gave up the throne for its sake. He was a warrior, a lawgiver, and a king. His name was Lycurgus. On their first meeting, the Ventru intended to make a meal of Lycurgus, but she stopped when he engaged her in conversation, talking about his own travels to Crete, Asia, and Egypt, what he learned of governance and law, and how he planned to shape the people into a war machine that would thrust them into legend. The Ventru listened like an attentive pupil, recalling Madan's folly centuries earlier, seeing both the threat and the utility of what Lycurgus would eventually unleash on ancient Greece. Her decision would shape the course of Clan Ventru forever. She would not seek to openly dominate or oppose Lycurgus's new Sparta. Instead, she would follow Sparta into the future, integrate herself into it, and use it as both her sword and shield. It was at this point that the Ventru took the name Artemis Orthia, the patron goddess of Sparta. Lycurgus instituted his great retra, established the Gerousia, the council of citizens and kings, the distribution of land among citizens, collective ownership of the helots, and the establishment of the agoge, the training hall for Spartan warriors. Artemis was surprised when the Spartans seized the neighboring country of Messina and turned them all into land-bound helots. With this large serf population, the Spartitiate could devote their entire lives to perfecting the art of war. In the Spartans, Artemis saw a flawless model of mortal potential. Other Ventru arrived in Peloponnesus, offering alliance and service to Artemis and the seemingly unstoppable juggernaut she sat atop. These Ventru traveled to other city-states, Corinth, Kythera, Melos, Pylos, Mantinia, Epidaurus, Boeotia, Lefkada, and Ambracia, and encouraged their leaders to recognize Sparta as hegemon, or be crushed. One Ventru, Evarchus, made his haven in Corinth, the premier mercantile power of Greece. Protected by Sparta, Corinth's merchant ships expanded their power and wealth, and Evarchus' personal fleet made him the first Ventru who was wealthy. The sword and the coin, two weapons that Ventru would wield for millennia to come. Now, the Ventru believe, rightly or wrongly, that the Bruja Antediluvian, the second one, not the first one, murdered their clan founder, a charge which the Bruja fervently deny. 
But the real start of the Brugia Ventru conflict can be traced to Artemis Orthia, Sparta, and Athens. The Brugia settled in Athens, much as the Ventru did in Peloponnesus. They enjoyed the fruits of Athens and encouraged the prosperity of the Delian League, to the detriment of the Peloponnesian League's power and wealth. After Athens attacked Corinth, Ivarchus demanded war, and Artemis supported him. The Peloponnesian War raged off and on for decades. The Ventru would not join the battle outright, as they were unwilling to risk their unlives for their mortal assets. The Brugia were safe behind Athens' long wall and had no reason to meet the Peloponnesians in the field. The Spartans could seize all of the land around Athens, but not the city itself. Necessity and custom required them to return to Sparta and Messina to keep the helots in check. But a clever Spartan general named Lysander hatched a plan to sink the Athenian navy and seize the Dardanelles, the Athenians' main source of grain. The Athenians surrendered after being ravaged by starvation and disease. Artemis and Avarchus entered Athens, triumphant, and ready to pass judgment on the Brugia, only to discover that they had long since abandoned the city. This indecisive resolution left a bitter taste in both the mouths of the Ventru and the Brugia. Artemis would reward Lysander with immortality for his victory, making him her child. Sparta enjoyed dominance over the entirety of Greece for a time, but she was caught off guard by the rise of the seven-gated city, Thebes. Now the Spartitiate population had declined by the fourth century, and the Spartans found themselves both outnumbered and outstrategized by the Thebans, using cavalry to disrupt the legendary Spartan phalanx. They laid so much pressure on the Spartans' weakened right flank that for the first time in their history, the Spartans broke. The victorious Thebans invited Sparta's enemies to come and join in the destruction of the city. Artemis and Lysander fled Sparta as her temple and her city burned behind her. By the third century BC, Artemis reached safety among the Etruscan Ventru of Italy. She established a haven at Syracuse in Sicily and sank into torpor for a decade or so. Artemis rose to find Sicily under siege by Brugia, only these were from some place in Africa called Carthage. The self-styled Prince of Syracuse, a Malkavian named Alcius, had just decapitated a Brugia envoy from Carthage and was uncertain as to his next move. Fortunately for him, he had the newly arisen Artemis to counsel him about preparation for war. Artemis added her voice to those of Alcius and her child, Lysander, calling for Camilla, Prince of Rome and Master of the Eternal Senate, for war against the ball-worshipping Brugia and Asimites of Carthage. In the Third Punic War, Artemis led the first sally into Carthage once the walls had been breached, and she was the first Ventru to die, as she was torn to pieces by a pack of frenzied Brugia. Number 9. Camilla. Senatus Populus Ceromanus. If one Ventru can be said to have shaped how his clan functions, it would be Camilla, the Prince of Rome for over a thousand years, and later, the Pontiff of Sin. Camilla, or Titus Venturus Camillus, was a prodigious but unimpressive youngest son of a respected patrician family. The Ventru Collet, the original Prince of Rome, recognized the seed of talent in the ignored young man and first made him his ghoul, then embraced him. Unlike Artemis, Collet had never ruled as a god, or even revealed his existence to anyone but his brood and his victims. The Romans were a proud, superstitious, and civic people. They were more likely to stake and burn a vampire than to coexist with one, to say nothing of worship. When the Romans went to war with the Greek king Pyrrhus, for whom the term Pyrrhic victory is coined, the insular, hidden Italian Ventru came into contact with Greek Ventru refugees fleeing from the dominance of Thebes and later Macedonia. Lysander, hero of the Peloponnesian War and child of Artemis, had taken refuge in the city of Tarentum. The city became a target of the Roman war effort and fell to the legions, just as Lysander fell into the hands of Camilla, Colat's most cunning child. Lysander, as a fellow Ventru, became Camilla's semi-willing guest in southern Italy and soon became Camilla's favorite sparring partner in nightly debates. Camilla, like the rest of Colat's brood, knew little of the world outside of Italy. Lysander told Camilla about the Greek world and the innovations that mortals seem to come up with as often as the sunrise. Like any good Ventru, they often debated questions of governance, of both mortals and vampires. 
Kamala had been trained by Kolat to believe that vampires should remain hidden in the shadow of mortal society, never draw attention to themselves, and exert secret influence where they could. Lysander's description of the open reign of his sire, the goddess Artemis Orthia, was absolutely alien to Kamala. Alien, but also fascinating. Kamala had no delusions about making himself into a god, but the possibilities of molding a mortal civilization the way Artemis had the Spartans set his mind racing. Kamala returned to Rome with Lysander at his side and laid out his own plan for the Roman Republic. As Kamala would later tell it, Colat saw the wisdom in his plan and stepped down as prince. But Ventru scholars believe that Kamala and Lysander simply murdered Colat and covered up the crime. Taking lessons from both Colat and Artemis, Kamala quietly approached the heads of the patrician families and bargained with them, a favor for a favor, quid pro quo. They would occasionally do his bidding in the Senate, and he would use his considerable power to obtain what they wanted, or put them in contact with someone who could, in exchange for consideration. In this way, Kamala was an innovator among vampires, and set the standard for how the Ventru would gain and hold power for centuries after. Despite being styled the Clan of Kings, Kamala was more a facilitator than ruler. He did not flaunt his power, but he only used as much power as was necessary to achieve his goals. The greatest example of Kamala's influence is the Roman road system. Reliable roads were not only necessary for military supremacy, but commercial supremacy as well. Kamala did not dominate anyone, nor did he threaten them. He simply made it clear to those in power that it was in their best interest to fix the freaking roads, and sat back while the problem was taken care of. Unfortunately for Kamala, he was too successful, and success made him decadent, though he had a little help. Rome was primarily a Ventru city, but vampires did come to Rome and custom demanded that they present themselves to Rome's master. One of these was a, let's just say, a vampire who presented themselves as a bruja, Tanit Bal Sahar, publisher of several popular travelogues and resident of Carthage. Lysander, who had a deep loathing for the Bruja going back to the Peloponnesian War, went to Carthage to investigate rumors of the Bruja and Asimites living openly among the mortal population, demanding blood tithes and practicing infernalism. He returned to Kamala in Rome, now glutted on blood and wealth himself, and demanded war against Carthage. But Kamala was reluctant to meet the Bruja in battle, much less so on their own ground. It was then that Lysander, the Malkavian prince Alcius, Artemis, and the Toreador antediluvian Arakel formed a coalition to drag Kamala to war, using Carthaginian incursions into Sicily as a casus belli. Despite the success of the First Punic War, Kamala was reluctant to press the advantage further. He feared the fate of Canaanites who set foot into Africa. They simply vanished without a trace. Additionally, he was too captivated by the novelty of Sahar's new Via Desideratio, the way of desire. A vampire philosophy encouraging vampires to fulfill their desires to keep their beasts sated. A philosophy of indulgence and carnality. It was the mortal senator and jurist, Cato the Elder, who spent decades raising the cry, Carthago de Linda Est, Carthage must be destroyed, that ignited the Roman people against Carthage. Lysander, now backed by a sizable coalition of Ventru, Malkavians, Toreador, repeated the refrain to Kamala until he finally agreed to the total destruction of the Asimite Bruja horde infesting Carthage. In 150 BC, the Romans laid siege to Carthage by land and sea in what was, for the Romans at least, a relatively quick and decisive victory. For the Canaanites, it was the bloodiest conflict any vampire had seen since the Second City. For five nights, the Ventru, Toreador, Malkavians, Gangrel, and Nosferatu battled in the blood-soaked streets of Carthage against the Bruja and Asimites. Artemis Orthia died in the first wave. Prince Alcius was so grievously wounded that he fell into torpor and has never awakened. Kamala's own child, Tiberius Carnifex, personally slew a cell of Asimites before succumbing to their poisonous vita. When the city fell and the enemy was defeated, Lysander ordered Carthage razed to the ground and the earth salted. For the mortals, it was more a symbolic gesture than practical. For the vampires, it was a powerful blood sorcery that trapped every vampire in torpor beneath Carthage so that they would never arise again, entombed 
for all eternity. With Carthage destroyed, Kamala found himself under siege. The Ventru and their allies all wanted a share of the spoils from Carthage or for the Prince of Rome to formally recognize claims of domain and spoils that they had already held in fact. For the first time since the Second City, the Ventru had to coexist with vampires of other clans. It was around this same time that Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Mark Antony were stripping Rome of its republican form. Camilla took note that he should do the same, at least among his own clan. Kamala demanded unity, not obedience, but unity. Naturally, as master of Rome, the greatest city in the world, his word should carry weight with any Ventru, but he would recognize and even enforce the autonomy of his fellow rulers, so long as they heeded his guidance. The Ventru, who were accustomed to being masters of themselves and whatever they could take, balked at this new and imperial regime. But Kamala set up a system of pre-station, adjudication, and record-keeping that the Ventru still use into the modern knights to ensure that his rule would be just, if it was not always merciful. And for those who would not abide Camilla's status as first among equals, well, they could expect an unpleasant visit from Lysander and his enforcers. Despite the poetic ring to the term, the fall of Rome, Rome never truly fell. Not in 476 when the German mercenary Udasir crowned himself king of Italy, nor at any other time. It simply changed its form. Rome is eternal, just like its master. But Kamala, after over a millennium of rule, grew tired of the changing empire and changing world. He slipped quietly into torpor and disappeared from the annals of history. Yet, he was not finished. An earthquake awoke Kamala from torpor. He reemerged in a world much different than the one he had left behind. Rome was no longer an empire of war and commerce. It was a spiritual empire of denial and self-abdegation. Armed with Sahars via Deseratio in his own volume on hunger and its satisfaction, Kamala ventured out of Rome for the first time since he brought Lysander with him to supplant Colot. As he departed Rome, he no longer walked the road of kings. Now he walked the road of sin and would be denied nothing that he desired. Number 8. Hardestat. There are few vampires who enjoy positions of simultaneous respect, fear, awe, and hatred from both enemies and allies alike, as the Ventru Hardestat. Hardestat, High Lord of the Fiefs of the Black Cross, the Black Monarch, and founder of the Camarilla. We've seen Greek and Italian Ventru. Hardestat represents the Germanic Ventru, as he was a native of Bavaria and made the majority of the Holy Roman Empire his personal domain. You are now free to insert your jokes about the Holy Roman Empire being neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Like any good Ventru, Hardestat was a student of history, and not just mortal history. He studied the clan's records of Artemis, Colot, and Kamala. Since Kamala's reign over Rome ended, the Ventru had once again fractured into factionalism. The remnants of Kamala's brood in Italy, a few Greek Ventru descended from Artemis and Avarcus, the Antonian Ventru of Constantinople, the Arpad Ventru of Hungary, Mithras's English Ventru, the Parisian Ventru under Geoffrey du Temple, and last but not least, Hardestat's German Ventru. Hardestat recognized that the Ventru had once been the most powerful, but it was when they had been unified as well. He recognized that the world was changing and that unity would once again be called for, and not just the unity of Clan Ventru, but of all vampires. Hardestat took a custom of the traveling court from the Emperor Charlemagne. He visited the havens of his vassals to take their temperature, adjudicate their disputes, and offer a reminder that their master kept his eye on them, whether they saw him or not. Hardestat was one of the most merciless of the vampire kings, and one of the most brutal enforcers of the sixth tradition, the masquerade, always to be punished with final death, regardless of how minor or great the offense. When the Inquisition and the Anarch Revolt began devouring vampires and elders, Hardestat's domain remained relatively safe and undisturbed. In 1395, Hardestat called a conclave in western Spain to discuss the Anarch problem and propose possible solutions. 
It was at this conclave that the Brugia Anarch Tyler attacked. Hardestat was wounded in killing all of Tyler's companions, but weakened enough that Tyler was able to diabolize Hardestat the Elder. But this was not the end. Hardestat had sired a number of children, one of whom was also named Hardestat. Hardestat the Younger, who suspiciously resembled his sire. By mutual agreement with his broodmates, Hardestat the Younger assumed the identity of their sire to keep their domains and causes and the nascent Camarilla united. Hardestat the Younger, unbeknownst to his brothers, tricked them into a blood bond, the better to maintain their silence. In 1400, by some connivance, Hardestat managed to secure the allegiance of the terrible Gangrel warlord, Karsh, adding his power to Hardestat's forces. By 1450, the Camarilla had more or less taken shape, and Hardestat the Younger acted as the first Ventru Justicar, though he never intended to hold the post permanently. Hardestat's hand in shaping the Camarilla is well known, but what is known almost exclusively to the Ventru is his coup within their own clan. As stated before, Hardestat dreamed of a unified clan, and unity among a clan bent towards rulership required clear organization, profit, and punishment. Hardestat, along with 12 other Ventru elders, formed a council of peers, modeled after the Gerousia of Sparta and the Senate of Rome, called the Ephorate. The Ephorate would not issue commands so much as guidance to other Ventru, who would show the proper consideration and deference to their elders' suggestions as well as adjudicate any disputes between Ventru peers away from the eyes and ears of the lesser clans. More elders joined Hardestat's forces until the Anarchs were forced to sue for peace at the Convention of Thorns in 1493. Hardestat was less interested in peace with the rebelling Anarchs than in their complete submission and told them as much on October 19, 1493, the second night of the Convention of Thorns. After the Zemitsi, Micah Vikos argued for the freedom of vampires from the rule of their elders. It's curious that despite his sire's brutal enforcement of the masquerade, Hardestat the Younger claimed to hold mortals in utter contempt, and hinted that he would not be opposed to reprisals against them for the Inquisition. The next night, while Hardestat was treating Vikos to another tongue lashing, Tyler famously made her appearance and attempted to assassinate Hardestat the Younger with a pair of flintlock pistols aimed directly at his unbeating heart. Despite the noise and smoke, Hardestat rose from the floor, wounded but in no danger of final death. Tyler fled the monastery before she could be captured. On October 23rd, before the ink on the Convention of Thorns was dry, the Anarchs launched a sabbat on the town of Silchester, England murdering and terrorizing the mortals of the town with reckless abandon. Hardestat and the other founders moved in to put down the Anarchs, and a vicious battle ensued, at the end of which the Sabbat were sent running. Hardestat and the Toreador Rafael de Corazon used their combined disciplines to erase and suppress the memories of the attack in the minds of the survivors, the first breach and repair of the masquerade in the Camarilla's young history. Number 7. Mithras For most of London's history, it has only ever had one true prince. That vampire was the Ventru, Mithras. The man who would become Mithras has some murky origins. He was an Indo-Iranian war leader in the 13th century BC, the latter part of the Bronze Age. The man who was not yet Mithras led his warriors in a campaign against rebel forces, hunting them into the mountains and putting them all to the sword all but one. One who entered Mithras' tent without resistance and halted Mithras' attack with a single word. As he was held by the stranger's power, the stranger informed Mithras that he was impressed by him and offered him a choice, eternal life or a quick death. Mithras chose eternal life and joined Clan Ventru. Now, there is some ambiguity as to the identity of Mithras' sire. His sire is named as Vedhartha, and Mithras is of the fourth generation, which would logically mean that Mithras' sire was most likely the Ventru Antediluvian. Yet, supposedly, the Antediluvian was killed way back in the second city by Trolley, the second Bruja Antediluvian. Some have proposed that Vedhartha is the name of a fourth generation Methuselah who sired Mithras and was subsequently diabolized by him, and yet, 
Mithras' Siniskal, Lady Anne Bosley, uses her blood bond with Mithras to mask her own Diablerist tendencies. It would make little sense, therefore, for a Diablerist to use the blood and aura of another Diablerist to conceal her own Diablery. The answer to the question of Mithras' lineage, while trivial on its surface, has some dire implications. It could mean that the Ventru Antediluvian successfully faked his own destruction and has been moving in the shadows of not only humanity, but Cainites for millennia, and no one has caught on. But back to Mithras. Mithras faked his own death and spent time adjusting to his new condition, exploring the world, and testing his power. When he returned to the world of mortals, he adopted the identity of Mithras, though it would be the Mithras of the Greek mystery cults rather than the Mithra of Zoroastrianism. Mithras was curiously worshipped as a god of the sun and of war among various people. He explained his nocturnal appearances by telling his followers that he was busy shepherding the sun across the heavens during the day, and his duty was only done when night fell. Whether Mithras introduced the Phrygian cap to the cult of Mithras, or he adopted the cap in keeping with their expectations is unknown, but Mithras, throughout his unlife, was rarely seen not wearing the unique headgear. The cult of Mithras took off during the time of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. The Mithraic Mysteries became a popular cult among Roman legionaries, who spread it throughout the Roman Empire. For reasons known only to Mithras himself, he journeyed to the farthest corner of the Roman Empire in 71 AD, Londinium. The constant warfare between the barbarians of the island and the Latins pleased Mithras, but he was not the first vampire to reach Britannia. The local vampires were not pleased that this powerful elder had come, seemingly backed by the might of the Roman legions, who also worshipped him as their god in their secret caverns. Mithras journeyed throughout Britain, cowing some into submission and allaying the fears of others, until he was recognized by his fellows as a sort of primer inter pares, the first among equals. Mithras' personal haven, the Mithraeum of Londinium, became a kind of proto-Elysium, a place where vampires could meet without fear of attack, and hosted venerable guests such as Bindusara and even the antediluvian of Clan Asimite, Hakim. Mithras held dominion over Britannia until the 5th century AD, when Rome, no longer able to support a massive sprawling empire and far-flung colonies, withdrew its legions. The vampires of Britannia took the decline of Rome as their signal to attack, and a civil war broke out between the elders and their children as their mortal herd suddenly declined. Mithras managed to retain his dominance, yet he was wounded in the fighting and sank into torpor for over five centuries. Mithras awoke in 1069 AD during the reign of William the Conqueror. As befit a war god, Mithras was awakened to the sound of battle going on above him, the revolt of Edgar the Atheling against William. Mithras did not return to Londinium until 1085, using a few years to tour Britannia and survey the state of both mortal and vampire politics. The Romans were long gone, replaced by the Normans from the continent. The tribal warlords Mithras had known were now replaced by new vampires, some still warlords, but many styling themselves as barons, to say nothing of the filthy werewolves stalking the countryside. Through subtle manipulation and negotiation, Mithras was able to gain the baron's acknowledgement of his supremacy. He established the courts of Avalon in London, and in 1154 was named King of Avalon by mutual agreement of the barons, around the same time that Henry Plantagenet established his dynasty among the English mortals. In 1212, Mithras had a battle with Horus, Lord of the Shems Heru, after Horus nearly killed Mithras' longtime sheriff, Athelwulf, a battle which left the Ventru severely weakened. In the 14th century, Mithras began traveling the country again, leaving the administration of London and Avalon in the hands of his Cappadocian Seneschal, Lord Camden. He followed the campaigns of Edward III disguised as a minor noble, but Mithras quickly returned to London in 1348 when the Black Plague ravaged the city. He laid the blame for the plague at the feet of the low clans, specifically the Setites, and expelled them and the Tremere from London, the first of several times that he would do so. As the Anarch Revolt swept through Europe, Hardestat the Younger sent emissaries to the court of Avalon to make a case for the Camarilla. 
Mithras loudly proclaimed that he would never scurry in the shadows and denounced the masquerade, despite enforcing it, in a way, through his blood laws. It's interesting that Mithras, and by extension Britain, never actually joined the Camarilla. But through Camden, Mithras negotiated a sort of reform to his blood laws, bringing them into something parallel to the Camarilla's traditions, while rejecting any authority that the founders or the inner circle might claim over Mithras' territory. This explains how Mithras would have the authority to repeatedly expel the Tremere, a Camarilla clan, from England. Additionally, Mithras vouchsafed the Convention of Thorns in 1493. In 1514, the Giovanni assassinated Lord Camden as part of their purge against the Cappadocians. In retaliation, Mithras barred the Giovanni from London on pain of final death and named his own child, the Duke of Amber, as Seneschal while he once again toured England and Europe. When Mithras returned in 1602, he found that Amber had practically given away the kingdom to the Scottish Toreador. To add insult to injury, there was even a Scottish ass, James I and IV respectively, resting comfortably on the throne of England. In a fit of fury, Mithras stripped Amber of his office and named Valerius, who had served as sheriff after the death of Athelwulf, to Seneschal. Mithras supported the parliamentarians in the English Civil War in the name of purging the Scottish and Toreador influences from the English throne. In 1666, the Great Fire consumed much of old London, thanks in no small part to the Tremere Andre Malat, the Giovanni, and the Settites. Mithras responded by banishing them all from London on pain of final death. The conflict between the English Ventru and the Scottish Toreador came to an end in 1693 with the Treaty of Durham, establishing Ventru supremacy and claiming the royal household as the exclusive domain of Prince Mithras. In 1798, Mithras again journeyed out of London. This time, his journeys took him to the farthest corners of the British Empire. When he returned in 1885, he was shocked to discover that not only were there Tremere in his city once again, but one of the warlocks had the audacity to sit on his privy council. In his absence, the Sabbat had attacked London. Valerius, in an attempt to shore up the city's defenses and curry favor with the Camarilla, invited the Tremere back to London gave them the right to embrace and establish domains, and even called himself prince after the Camarilla fashion. Mithras very nearly frenzied. Before the assembled primogen, Mithras stripped Valerius of his title, personally seized him, and threw him from the building. Mithras then elevated Valerius's child and protege, Lady Anne Bosley, to the office of Seneschal. During the German Blitz of London, the Luftwaffe bombs drove the ancient Methuselah into torpor, where he remained until 1996. Almost immediately after, he was set upon by a pack of werewolves. Despite being freshly arisen and lacking blood, he tore the lupines to pieces, but was so taxed from the effort that he fell from exhaustion. And it was at this point that a certain Asimite anti-tribu named Montgomery Coven came upon the Ventru Methuselah and did what Asimites do so well. Coven diablerized Mithras, doing what centuries of enemies could not and destroyed the Lord of London once and for all. Of course, Coven may discover in future nights that he has bitten off just a little bit more than he could chew. Number 6. Cretheus. If Mithras exemplified the Via Regalis, the Road of Kings, what it is to be Ventru, then his child, Cretheus, rejected it all to follow the antediluvian Solit along the narrow and winding path to Golconda. Cretheus was born in ancient Corinth and was quickly recognized as a polymath. He toured the centers of learning in the ancient world in Greece, Egypt, and Persia, studying arithmetic, geometry, astrology, medicine, law, sophistry, and the occult. After nine years of study, he learned of a competition in Ecbatana, Persia. A Persian lord offered a prize to any learned man who could best all of his competitors in wits and argumentation. After a month of competition, Cretheus emerged as the victor. It was only then that he learned what the prize was and who had actually sponsored the contest. Mithras. In 430 BC, the Ventru Methuselah embraced Cretheus and blood bonded the sage to him. For the next 600 years, Cretheus served as Mithras's vizier. Cretheus was also instrumental in building the cult of Mithras. 
Mithras supplied the necessary drama and ritual, while Cretheus, having outstripped his sire's esoteric knowledge and learned the ancient blood magic known as Duranki, mastery of heaven and earth, provided mystical power to support Mithras' grand claim of divinity. Cretheus followed his sire to Britannia, but returned to Rome when Mithras fell into torpor, with the instructions to wake his sire when the next empire arose. Sadly, Cretheus was not as diligent as he should have been. The vizier of Mithras nodded off into torpor for a decade. When he awoke, the capital of the empire had moved further east to a sleepy little coastal town named Byzantium, and the emperor, Constantine, had made Christianity the official religion of the empire. The failure did not trouble Cretheus much. The cult of Mithras had always been his sire's project, not his. He was more interested in personal transcendence, in casting off the shackles of the beast and ascending, through mysticism, to heaven. But Cretheus' sorcery failed him in this. But when he heard of a vampire who had journeyed to the farthest regions of the east and returned with the secret of transcending the beast, Cretheus spent nine years tracking down this learned vampire. At the end of his search was none other than Solit, antediluvian of Clan Salubri. Cretheus became Solit's most ardent disciple. In the fashion of a true Greek scholar, he did what had never occurred to any of Solit's other disciples. He wrote his master's words down. Mithras never summoned Cretheus to him, and as far as Cretheus was concerned, Mithras could sleep until Gehenna came. Cretheus, or Cret, as he was called by younger vampires who could not be bothered with the proper pronunciation of his name, soon had disciples of his own. This put him in the odd position of being both disciple and master. Though he had not yet reached Golconda himself, he was still further along the path than those who looked to him for guidance. As the author of the Analects of Solit, Cret was looked to as an authority on Solit and Golconda. When Solit was destroyed by Tremere, Cretheus vowed to continue Solit's work. He later found, or was rather found by, a salubri named Mokur, the last of the salubri sired by the antediluvian himself. As he had done with Solit, Cretheus dutifully recorded every utterance that fell from Mokur's ancient lips and pressed Mokur for stories and recollections of Solit. Cretheus' tenure with the cult of Mithras had its benefit in his new work. He had the organizational skills to build a network across Europe dedicated to promoting the message and ill-defined benefits of Golconda. Other like-minded elders soon joined him. One, a Zemitsi named Danica Ruthven, offered Cretheus the use of her ancestral castle, Hunadoara, as an academy and base of operations. Cretheus and the newfound Council of Twelve would use this location to monitor and direct the activities of the Inkanu around the world. Solid had once counseled Cretheus that to reach Suspire, one needed faith as well as reason. And faith was something that Cretheus could never quite wrap his razor-sharp mind around. Oh, he had faith in power, the power of knowledge and the power of sorcery, but not faith in others. When Mokur went, willingly, to his death at the fangs of the Tremere Etrius, Cretheus had his first genuine crisis of faith. And in that moment, Cretheus felt fear, and that fear led him to make a terrible choice, a pact with a being older than creation itself. Thanks to Cretheus, the leaders of the Inkanu are now safely ensconced within the mystical boundaries of Hunadawara Castle. Thanks to the pact and his own arrogance, Cretheus' humanity has withered, even as his mystical power has expanded. He has used this power to hunt down the ancients in their pawns, hoping to locate them and destroy them before Gehenna and save the world. Little does he know that his master, Solit, has won his contest of wills against Tremere and is preparing to test his wayward disciple. Cretheus may merge from the crucible of God purified of his vanity, or he may be consumed by the flame. Number 5. Kyle Strathcona a weakness of the Ventru strategy calling for a united front against all other clans is that it leaves some Ventru feeling that their talents go unappreciated or misused. One such Ventru is the anti-tribu, Kyle Strathcona. He is a rarity within the Sabbat. Not only is he a Ventru, but he was not embraced into the Sabbat. He holds high office as Cardinal of the Northern Territories, and he adheres to the path of humanity. But how did this soldier become a leader of men, 
and then a leader of monsters. Kyle Strathcona was born in the late 15th century in Scotland. In the early 16th century, he fought for King James VI of Scotland against the English as part of the larger Italian wars between France and the Papal States. At the Battle of Flodden in 1511, Strathcona distinguished himself for valor in that battle for leadership, despite being on the losing side. When the Peace of London briefly ended the fighting in 1513, the London Ventru claimed Strathcona as part of their war prize from the Scottish Toreador who ruled from Edinburgh. In 1514, the Ventru Collinsworth embraced Strathcona, much to his chagrin. The English Ventru kept Kyle in their country for a time to train him and familiarize him with the expectations of being one of their clan before returning him to Edinburgh as an emissary. Strathcona received a chilly welcome at Edinburgh, much as he had expected. He was too Scottish for the London Ventru and too Ventru for the Scottish Toreador. He spent 50 years cut off from his fellow vampires on both sides and grew bitter as time passed. He spent that time honing his swordsmanship, building his power base, and waiting for the opportunity to avenge himself against the Ventru. He eventually won the trust of the Scottish Toreador through sheer force of personality. In 1707, the English Ventru managed to force the Scottish Toreador into ruin and submission when Scotland's colony in Panama failed and Scotland was forced to join the United Kingdom under English rule. Under the terms of the truce between the Toreador and Ventru, each side would retain a certain number of hostages to ensure that the peace was not breached. In 1715, when the Scots rose up against English rule, Strathcona convinced the Toreador that the Ventru had betrayed them. The Toreador destroyed several local Ventru, who had been identified by Kyle while ensuring his safety. The English Ventru never retaliated for the massacre or even suspected Kyle's involvement. In 1763, when France ceded control of its North American territories to Britain, Kyle Strathcona traveled to Canada to become Prince of Montreal. Montreal was a French city, and Strathcona manipulated the lingering French-Scottish sympathies to secure his position with the locals. Mithras, the Prince of London, recognized Strathcona's claim because he believed that Strathcona would be easy to manipulate. But what neither Mithras nor Strathcona realized was that the Sabbat had already sank its claws into the city of Steeples and was prepared to declare its independence. The dominant pack of the city, the Shepherds of Cain, watched Strathcona for a time, recognized his discontent with the Ventru and the Camarilla, and encouraged him to defect. Strathcona came to respect and eventually admire the Sabbat's claims of freedom and willingness to die and fight for a cause. When Prince Kyle Strathcona withdrew from the Camarilla and took the city of Montreal with him, it was the single greatest defeat for the English Ventru since the Toreador managed to put King James VI on the English throne. With the support of the Shepherds of Cain, Kyle Strathcona excelled as Archbishop of Montreal, and his reign saw the city of black miracles become the Sabbat's second greatest stronghold on the continent, surpassing New York and rivaling Mexico City. Even after being elevated to Cardinal, Strathcona has paid close attention to the affairs of Montreal. Some of what he has seen, especially during the tenures of Sangris the Serpent and Carolina Velez, greatly concerned him. He sees a divided and hypocritical Sabbat, not only in Montreal, but across Canada, and perhaps throughout the sect. As far as Kyle can tell, the Sabbat has lost its sense of community, accomplishment, unity, and purpose. The only things separating the Sabbat from the Anarchs of California are the Valdery and the Rite, and even then, fledglings treat those like chores. Once again, Kyle Strathcona plots betrayal. This time, he hopes his betrayal will unite the Sabbat and return it to its true spirit. He is well aware that some Camarilla Justicars, such as Jaroslav Pachik and Anastas de Zagreb, have designs on Montreal and allows information about the weaknesses of the city, both real and imagined, to leak to Anastas. Strathcona hopes that the Tremere is young enough and desperate enough to prove himself to swallow the bait whole and attack the city unprepared. His hope is that the Sabbat, faced with an external threat, will stop fighting each other and unite against the Camarilla. But if he is wrong, Montreal might meet the same fate as New York. Number 4. Lucinda 
The Ventru Lucinda was created to serve as a weapon for both Clan Ventru and the Camarilla. In 1656, her sire, Severus, plucked her from the herd of humanity and embraced her. Lucinda remembers nothing of her mortal life, likely due to her sire's mental influence, nor does she wish to. She learned her lessons quickly and then served Severus, then Justicar of Clan Ventru, as his most dedicated Archon. Lucinda has served every Ventru Justicar since then, whether by their request or her petition, though she has spent several periods of time in torpor. When she arose in the 1930s, she learned that Michalis, a former lover of hers, had been appointed as Justicar and sought him to offer her services. But it wasn't Michalis at all. He had been murdered and replaced by the Setite Methuselah, Kementiri. Kementiri secretly enslaved Lucinda to her via the blood bond. After the Tremere exposed Kementiri, Lucinda was summoned to a conclave in Munich, Germany. In addition to the creation of the Red List, the Inner Circle named Lucinda as the first Alistair, an Archon specifically tasked to hunt down and destroy vampires placed on the Red List. She was ordered to hunt down all of the Anathema, all except Kementiri. Whether they sensed some taint in Lucinda, or simply regarded her proximity to the false Justicar as reason enough for suspicion is unclear. As for Lucinda, she hunted Kementiri without authorization for years, compelled by the blood bond to seek out her mistress and offer the Setite her service and devotion. She destroyed many of the Camarilla's enemies, but Kementiri eluded her secret hunt. The blood bond faded enough for Lucinda to realize that Kementiri had only used her as a convenient tool and how she had been tossed aside when her usefulness was done. Her love for her mistress was exceeded by her hatred. Lucinda secluded herself for years until she was free of the blood bond, but was so spent from the effort that she once again sank into torpor for several years. In 1994, Lucinda arose from torpor to find the first clue of commentary that she had had since her hunt began, a letter from the Anathema Tremere, Valerius Maior, to Kementiri proposing the creation of a faction comprised of vampires on the Red List. For a time, she hunted down leads of Kementiri, only to be met with dead ends, dead contacts, and the occasional ambush. When Lucinda ran out of leads, she presented her findings to the Inner Circle at the Venice Conclave. The elders questioned her thoroughly about the letter and her investigation, before dismissing her to deliberate on what they had just heard. Lucinda was shocked when the Inner Circle summoned her once again into their presence and appointed her as Justicar for Clan Ventru. She accepted out of a sense of duty, though she had some apprehensions about the reason for her appointment. After naming some Archons she trusted, she disappeared again. A few months later, a vicious battle broke out between Lucinda's coterie and the Semedi child anathema, Ganina. After an hour, Ganina was subdued, staked, and shipped off to face the Inner Circle's judgment. Lucinda vanished once more to continue her hunt for the Anathema. Number 3. Loden The vampire who would become Loden was born Olaf Holt in 1824 to a pair of Norwegian immigrants to Pennsylvania. Olaf joined the U.S. Army and fought in the Mexican-American War, rising to the rank of lieutenant. During the Battle of Veracruz in 1847, Olaf seized important Mexican artillery, earning praise and commendation from his commanders. He also earned the attention of the Toreador, Elitria, Prince of Veracruz and child of Helena. Elitria was disinterested in the political implications of the battle and more interested in finding capable warriors who could be relied on to control Veracruz's mortal population. Elitria wanted to embrace Olaf herself but feared inciting jealousy in her Ventru lover, Datura, so she offered Olaf to Datura instead. The trio remained in Vera Cruz for 22 years, but over time, Olaf and Elitria grew close, much to Datura's displeasure, and Olaf was forced to leave Vera Cruz or risk a possible conflict with his sire. He traveled to Chicago, where he presented himself to the reigning prince, Maxwell, as Loden. Loden took stock of Prince Maxwell and immediately began planning to usurp the Bruja. His opportunity came when a Malkavian set fire to Chicago in 1871 in what would later become known as the Devil's Night, 
a conflagration that would burn down 18,000 buildings and destroy most of Maxwell's vampire allies. In the chaos, Loden took a coterie to Maxwell's mansion to assassinate the prince. After a brief battle, Maxwell leapt out of a window and fled the city. The Camarilla subsequently recognized Loden as prince. Loden presided over the rebuilding of the Windy City, smoothing efforts of investors, speculators, and reformers to turn the city of Chicago into an industrial powerhouse. The first challenger to Loden's rule was the Toreador Modius, operating out of nearby Gary, Indiana. What was more troubling was that Modius had the backing of three powerful elders, Inyanga, Khalid, and Proset, who disapproved of Loden's coup against Maxwell. Loden also had to deal with the burgeoning labor movement that his own police and private detective forces seemed unable to contain. In a pair of bold moves, he embraced labor leader Tommy Hines to capture the labor movement and baited the Anarchs into violating the masquerade. When the Anarch Balthazar switched sides to Loden, he had all of the support he needed to launch a series of retaliatory blood hunts against his vampire enemies, Anarch and Camarilla alike. Loden also placed Gary, Indiana under a ruinous interdiction, permanently wrecking the city's economy. As prince, Loden ruled with an iron fist and made liberal use of the right to progeny, creating a massive brood of 12 eighth generation Ventru to protect his rule and administer various parts of the city. In response, the elders of Chicago strengthened their prerogative by establishing both Primogen and Elysium to check Loden's more destructive urges. In 1968, Loden and Balthazar orchestrated one of the largest purges of anarchs in Camarilla history under the cover of the riots during the Democratic National Convention. Now that might have been the end of Loden's anarch problem, but for the sudden and mysterious arrival of a vampire named Mal Davis, who rallied the demoralized anarchs to her banner. Loden, overconfident in his own power, began asserting greater control over the city. He hardly noticed that he had turned half of the primogen against him and was wholly ignorant that the same half were also assisting Mal Davis' rise to power within the Anarchs. When Harold Washington became mayor of the city, protected by Mal Davis, Loden had been caught off guard. The primogen warned him not to attack Mal Davis, but he ignored them, only to find that Mal Davis was suspiciously well prepared for his reprisal. Between 1983 and 1987, Loden fought a losing war against Mal Davis, mostly through mortal pawns, but he was losing more forces through attrition than she was. In 1987, Loden was reduced to begging the Primogen for their help. They agreed, in exchange for concessions from Loden, including greater freedom to create progeny, and that he attend their councils at least once a month to hear their concerns. With the Primogen once again at his back, Loden executed the Thanksgiving Massacre in 1987. He had learned of the locations of Mal Davis' most trusted allies and sent his mortal servants to pay them a noontime visit. When night fell, the prince's vampire forces hunted the Anarchs from haven to haven, their every safe house seemingly known to Loden. Mal Davis herself nearly fell into Loden's hands, but by means he never discovered, she escaped him. Loden never suspected that he was just another pawn in the long-running jihad between the Methuselahs Helena and Menelay and that the enemies he fought to gain and keep his domain against were just pieces sent against him by the Bruja. In 1993, werewolves attacked the Succubus Club, killing numerous vampires at the behest of Menelay. Loden, in retaliation, declared a blood hunt against all of the lupines of Chicago. At first, the vampires managed to kill several werewolves, but the werewolves quickly counterattacked, destroying many vampires in their own havens, on the streets, or anywhere else they could be found. A full third of the city's vampires died during the War of Chicago. Prince Loden, betrayed by his own child, Al Capone, yes, that Al Capone, was attacked by a force of werewolves and Black Hand assassins. Whoever killed Loden, the bomb that set fire to Loden's mansion ensured that his body could never be recovered. Number 2. Louis Fortier now I'll bet you thought there weren't any Ventru Anarchs, didn't you? Well, I've got one right here for you. Louis Charles Fortier de la Belliere was born in 1726 in France. Unfortunately for Louis, he was the second son of the Comte de la Belliere, leaving him in the position of spare heir, 
while his elder brother inherited all of the title and lands. So Louis was faced with two options, the military or the church. When Louis imagined a life without women, his choice was easy. Silly boy. Since when has a vow of chastity ever stopped a clergyman from getting some naive peasant girl into his bed, and then confessing the sin afterwards? Anyway, in another stroke of bad luck, Louis, along with his regiment of well-dressed second sons like himself, were shipped off to New France to subdue the natives and deliver the fabulous wealth of the Americas back to their king. While there isn't a great deal of gold to be found in eastern Canada, Louis demonstrated himself to be a natural leader. When the French and Indian War erupted in North America, Louis was 28, his brother was healthy and happy, and Louis had three equally healthy and happy nephews, so the title of Comte was unlikely to ever become his. Louis planned one more expedition to Canada before retiring his commission and founding his own trading company. One summer evening, Louis and his men came to a nearly deserted native camp. The braves were all seemingly gone, and only the women, children, and an old shaman were present. The natives shared their food with the Frenchmen. When the sun disappeared below the horizon, the old shaman began beating a drum and chanting something in his native tongue. One by one, the Frenchmen drifted off to sleep, all except Louis. From the opposite end of the camp, a woman of exquisite beauty stepped into the light of the campfire and beckoned Louis to follow her into the woods. Yeah, because that's not suspicious at all. But Louis, being many things but, above all, a true Frenchman, pursued the woman into the dark. As they came to a copse of trees, the woman stepped out of the white doeskin dress she wore, her skin nearly translucent under the moonlight. Louis was powerless as she took him into her embrace, literally and figuratively. When Louis awakened, the woman was gone, and he was naked as a baby. At first, he was amused by his supposed conquest. When he staggered back to the camp, he found it empty of natives, but not empty of Frenchmen. His men were splayed across the ground like broken toys, their throats torn open and covered in blood. It was then that he noticed the blood smeared across his own face and chest. Louis was alone in the wilderness of Canada and abandoned by his sire with a nature and hunger he could not understand. But what he did know was that he could never again return to France. He could never explain what happened that night. Since people disappeared in the woods all the time, it was simple enough to assume that the same wolves that had savaged his men had dragged his own corpse off never to be found again. Louis journeyed to New York for a time, but when the Sabbat established itself in that city, Louis abandoned it in favor of California. He first settled in San Francisco where the ship deposited him. In 1912, he journeyed south to Los Angeles. Louis ingratiated himself to the Toreador Prince, Don Sebastian, and was invited to join the Primogen Council. Spurred by a sense of honor and noblesse oblige, Louis was the only one who spoke up against Don Sebastian's abuse of the Anarchs and protested when Don Sebastian had Jeremy McNeil beaten. When Louis found no support among his fellow Primogen, he broke with Don Sebastian and joined the Anarchs himself. In return for Louis' assistance, McNeil and the Anarchs left him and his domain of West Los Angeles untouched, not that Louis needed much help defending it himself. During the life of the Anarch Free State, Louis' primary concern was the protection of his domain, with the interest of the Anarch Free States coming in a, let's say, respectable second. McNeil and Crispus Attucks' talk of democracy and liberty offended his noble sensibilities, but Louis was curious as to how their experiment in vampire democracy would turn out. Spoiler alert, it ends in disaster. Louis made his haven in a mansion in Beverly Hills, filled with the most beautiful and expensive things money could buy. And speaking of beautiful things, Louis' coterie includes three of the most beautiful and deadly women in the Anarch Free States, Catherine Dubois, Elena Gutierrez, and Marielle Sengen. It is rumored that Louis maintains a veritable army of ghouls, so numerous that he and his mistresses have trouble keeping them all supplied with Vitae. Everything changed when the Kwai Jin began the Great Leap Outward and the foreigner vanquishing crusaders landed on the west coast. Fortier, an able military commander in life, wiped out the bone-polishing faction and the Yellow Dragon Society. But the Anarchs, even when confronted by the alien and deadly Kwai Jin, 
could not stop their pointless infighting, and the war turned into a battle of attrition. When McNeil's close ally, Salvador Garcia, turned from the Anarch cause and allied with the Quajin, Louis knew that the Free States were finished. The Quajin came to Louis in turn and offered him the position of Minister of the Western City of Angels in their new promised Mandarinate. Louis accepted. Out of respect for McNeil, he held back the Quajin long enough for the Bruja to escape Los Angeles. Louis knows that the Quajin despise him in their hidden rooms, but he will eventually bring them around. He's played this game for a very long time, and he knows all of the maneuvers and steps very well, regardless of whether his opponents are vampires or Quajin. Number 1. Lady Anne Bosley If you were to sum up Lady Anne Bosley's philosophy of life and unlife, it would be this. The world gives only what you want when you have it by the throat. And if there were ever a Ventru who mastered the art of working one's will through mortal institutions, it would be Lady Anne. Anne inherited her worldview and station from her father, one of the important men of Warwickshire in the early 17th century. Her father found her a suitable husband, and it was a polite, passionless, but profitable arrangement. Lord Bosley received a well-bred wife, and Anne was taken care of and gained access to her husband's wide network of political contacts. When he died, Anne joined a circle of noblemen who desired to seize power in England. But unlike her father, Anne did not want to go through the dance of uprooting old kings and planting new ones. She wanted a king who would submit to the rule of Parliament, and her work was critical to the success of the parliamentarians. In 1688, William of Orange deposed James II in the Glorious Revolution and bargained away several royal prerogatives to Parliament in exchange for their recognition of him as the lawful sovereign. Anne's role with the parliamentarians did not go unnoticed. Valerius of Clan Ventru and Seneschal to Prince Mithras was impressed by her skill as a kingmaker and petitioned his lord to embrace her. Lady Anne carried out tasks for both Valerius and Mithras demonstrating her capability and competence while slowly gaining control over Parliament. As Valerius was the right hand of Mithras, Lady Anne was the right hand of Valerius, and her favor quickly became a valuable commodity to the vampires of London. Lady Anne slowly, but cautiously, worked to usurp the powers of the monarchy to Parliament, reducing the crown to a source of authority, but rendering it unable to make policy. This had the curious effect of preserving the monarchy of England in the centuries when monarchs were being toppled across Europe by the emerging middle class and the disaffected peasantry. When Mithras disappeared in 1798, Valerius became the de facto Prince of London and elevated Lady Anne to his Seneschal. But Mithras returned to London in 1885 and was sorely displeased by what he found, particularly the surplus of treacherous warlocks in his city and one that Valerius had the temerity to place on the primogen. Lady Anne was confronted with a stark choice, support her sire or support Mithras. She chose Mithras. After he had sufficiently humiliated Valerius and exiled him, the eternal prince named Lady Anne as Seneschal in Valerius's place. Lady Anne was generously rewarded for her loyalty. Twice she was allowed to commit diablerie on Mithras's enemies, lowering her generation. Her blood is now more potent than her sire's, but she has developed an addiction to diablerie and seeks out covert opportunities to feed on elder vampires. Her blood bond to Mithras masked the taint of diablerie in her own aura. In 1941, the German Luftwaffe bombed Mithras's haven, driving him into torpor. Lady Anne and her retainers recovered his body and hid him, though she did not reveal to anyone else what had happened to him. She quickly summoned the Primogen and the vampires of the city, and declared herself Queen of London. The decision to take the title of Queen was both political and personal. Despite numerous female vampires accepting the customary styling of Prince, Lady Anne disliked the masculine sound of the new title, and the title of Princess was too diminutive and dismissible, especially in light of Lady Anne's tiny 5'2 body. Queen struck the right chord with her. Politically, she intended for her title to be seen as a mere vanity and would cause some vampires to underestimate her to their own detriment. Lady Anne, excuse me, Queen Anne, kept the subject of Mithras close to her vest. Some vampires believed that he died in the Blitz. 
Others suspected that Queen Anne had slain him herself. Yet others, especially the Tremere, suspected that he was laying low, as he often had, and was waiting for his enemies to overplay their hand and expose themselves, and then swoop down and destroy them. When Queen Anne confirmed that Mithras had been destroyed in 1996, she suppressed the information while she shored up her own bases of power, placing Ventru subservient to her in important positions on the Primogen, bribing the Toreador into supporting her, and then baiting the Tremere into scheming against her. When she leaked out that Mithras had been destroyed in a battle with werewolves, the Tremere obligingly took that opportunity to try and snatch London out of her grasp. She answered, not with Parliament, but by destroying the Tremere behind the veil of the masquerade, and much to the relief of the Camarilla, who had become concerned about the heavy-handed influence of London's kindred in mortal politics. With the defeat of the Tremere coup, Queen Anne Bosley reigned undisputed over London. Ave Regina Eterna, hail the Eternal Queen. And those were the top 10 vampires of Clan Ventru. If you've made it through all 13 of these videos, or if you just listened to this one, thank you. These videos have been a labor of love. I understand that Vampire the Masquerade, even at the height of its popularity, was always a very niche product, but I genuinely enjoyed buying the content, reading the content, and playing the game. And now that I've got the 13 modern clans out of the way, be on the lookout for a video on the top 10 clanless vampires, the outcasts of vampire society, and the harbingers of Gehenna, the caitiff. Until next time.